All right, I think it's time we get underway. Welcome to the Space Sustainability Research Program reports from our Space Sustainability Fellows. This is the Secure World Foundation. Uh, my name is Chris Johnson. I'm the Spatial Advisor here at the Secure World Foundation. Uh, we are going to be over going to be going over our research fellowship reports. Uh, you know, firstly, as a, as some housekeeping notes, I'll, I'll first thank everyone for coming back to our rescheduled uh, webinar. Uh, we in, originally intended to do this last week, uh, but technical issues with Zoom and changing a meeting setting from uh, from a from a meeting to a webinar caused uh, untold mayhem in the logistics of it. So we apologize for that, and I apologize for that. Nevertheless, we're gonna get underway with our two research fellows. Uh, first, I wanna talk a little bit about what the program is and why we do this program. So I've written there, aimed at investigating fundamental questions and clarifying fundamental concepts in space sustainability, including space as a global commons, and that issue of applying polycentric governance concepts to space. The reason that we have these research fellowships and we have focused research is because uh, over the life and course of Secure World's work in our various fora, international fora, national fora, academia, scientific community, commercial actors, in the discussions that we have on promoting and fostering space sustainability, we quite often continually uh, run into I would say issues that have to do with assumptions about outer space and governance of outer space, where where we kind of see this is where the 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 debate and the discussion ends, where some actors just um, you know voice their assumptions um, or come to conclusions that are not uniformly shared, and we felt that you know in actually in order to push the conversation forward, we do need to have focused research and really shine a light on some of these areas which we do have these underlying assumptions and um, um, I would say misconceptions. So one of those and, and, and that we'll get into is um, on global commons and is that quote unquote, is space space itself a global commons? And another one on, well, where should governance happen in the space domain? We felt that these were key issues and questions to look at and see if we can contribute to the discourse out there and make something which we hope is impartial, we hope is lasting and useful uh, to, to contribute to those discussions. So th this is why Secure World has set up this fellowship program last year with two of those issues and questions to be looked at. Uh, and we're gonna continue with these research fellowship programs, the research that we do, and to really um, continue to solve these persistent um, obstacles that we have in the discourse that we have as, as we try and foster and promote space sustainability. So here's the agenda for today. Uh, after I've given this introduction and some housekeeping notes, we're gonna have uh, Claire present on uh, polycentricity and space governance, 10 minutes for Q&A, then we'll have Mr. Daniel Patton uh, answer that question space as a commons is space a commons we're gonna have some questions the questions that you can submit are please submit in the q a function and not the chat function we have turned off because uh, this is a webinar we've turned off video for attendees but you can certainly still put your questions in there um in the q a we are recording this and for the people who can attend now we do hope to be posting it uh, on on a couple different sites uh, within the next couple days, 24, 48, 72 hours. Um, so uh, so those who are not in attendance can can also take part. Uh, in addition to the posting of the full reports and the executive summaries from our excellent scholarly research fellows. So uh, with that, I'm going to now make an introduction to Ms. Claire Otto. She is a senior policy analyst at the University of Virginia's National Security Policy Center. Uh, and prior to joining UVA, she was a communications specialist at the DOE, Department of Energy. Claire earned a Master in Public Policy in Space and National Security from George Washington University and a BA in Comparative Politics from the University of California, San Diego. You can see the research questions that we posed uh, uh, for applicants to the research fellowship on the right side of your screen, those bullet pointed questions. I'm going to now hand over the remote control to Claire, and um, she'll be able to talk about those questions and then talk about her, her research and her findings and her conclusions. 
So Claire, uh, if you've turned your microphone on and turned your camera on. Uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. So uh, I'll give you the floor and you can go over those questions and you should also be able to run the slides. Is that true? I believe so, yeah. Good, yeah, all right. Great. Floor is yours. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, thank you so much for having me, first off. And um, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to do this research this past semester. Um, it, I learned a lot and it, it was a really good time. Um, so hope that this uh, can sort of help contribute to any sort of space governance uh, conversations. Uh, to get started, just um, I definitely need an agenda to keep me organized. So we're gonna go over the um, guiding questions that we originally had at the beginning of last semester um, and what was posed by SWF and how maybe that changed a little bit over the course of the research. Um, then looking really quick at uh, polycentricity, kind of what it is, where it comes from. Um, some of that will be uh, some of the, um, some of the uh, literature that I, I looked at, some of the foundational polycentricity literature, some of the space governance lit. Um, in that, I also took a look at some analogous domains. So I'm gonna take a look at a few of the, the ones that came up and had some good lessons learned, um, and then move on just to my findings and some application at the end. Um, so first off, the questions that I got from Secure World, uh, there were sort of three main ones, as Chris's slide had, and as they are here. Um, generally, the first was, how does the existing body of literature on polycentric governance uh, connect to and inform space governance? Uh, then looking at that, seeing, you know, if there were any gaps, what was missing from the discussion. Um, and then looking to how we can apply the concepts from other domains and concepts from the, the theory to both near-term work in space governance and long-term sustainability. Um, so initially I had thought that the value add was gonna be more of a review of the polycentric literature and the connections to space, but there are already quite a few really good, really current resources there. Um, the Ostrom workshop, obviously, uh, Stephen Marshall McGinnis did a really good review in 2019 of polycentricity from 1951 uh, until 2019. And uh, Tepper and uh, Kuhn and Schindler from the Open Lunar Foundation both have very current uh, connections to space governance. So that was great to find and good to have, but I sort of shifted after that from thinking that this would be more of a, a literature review and connection to looking more at the last question, um, specifically kind of trying to take a look at how can this be added to how we think about um, applied governance, uh, building a framework, which in you know poly uh, in policy schools is a big big thing that we love to do. So it was a good project. Um, but before I could get to that, of course, first I needed to look at what polycentric governance was. Um, it's a concept that I found myself sort of having trouble explaining at the beginning because it seemed to me kind of um, so um, so inherent in so many things and so understandable. Um, so polycentric governance in uh, over the review of the literature that I found, um, kind of the, the broadest definition, the one that includes the most things is a system in which multiple authorities oversee the same area with overlapping interests and differing scopes of responsibility. So we can see this in I mean, metropolitan governance is where it was generally originally kind of applied in governance theory. Um, there's a lot of environmental management uh, polycentric theory. You know, if you think about like a power grid, there are lots of, you know, more local power grids, but we care about it as a, as a nation. Um, so it's sort of so inherent and so simple that it can be a little difficult to describe. Um, but yeah, so that's that's sort of the concepts. Obviously, on the other hand, uh, monocentric governance is when there's one overarching authority that sees oversees everything. Um, moving on, looking at the polycentricity lit literature, just to get a, a brief foundation. Um, it first was kind of articulated as a concept by Pollyanni in 1951. He wasn't a political scientist. 
he um, instead articulated this more looking at the concept of science and scientific research, um, called it a, the self-coordination of independent research initiatives. Um, and it was then applied to governance. Uh, most, I think, notably early on uh, by Ostrom, Tybout, and Warren in 1961. They took a look uh, for quite, quite a while at metropolitan governance and specifically used the idea of polycentricity. So um, the idea of local municipalities all under, you know, a, a city that's under a county, that's under a state, that's under a, a country. Um, it's a very polycentric framework. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom uh, continued this look at metropolitan governance, but also applied it um, pretty often to metropolitan or to environmental management as well. Uh, and then more recently, we have uh, seen it expanded upon and applied to a lot of internet governance, um, which is Shackelford and uh, Tepper. Both have done uh, really interesting work expanding this to cyber governance and uh, recently space governance, like I had mentioned, uh, the work of the Open Lunar Foundation and of uh, Tepper again. So some really great resources. They're definitely, yeah, all of these are linked in the report. Um, worth a look for sure. Um, so some other research just kind of adding on to the idea of um, governance and maybe a framework to start thinking about space governance through a polycentric lens, um, obviously looking at the large body of space governance research that there is. Um, there's some really good books by Clay Maltz, um, Martin France and John Fox. Uh, there are quite a few resources there. Um, also looking at norms, uh, back to sort of foundational norm literature, uh, Finnamore and Skikink, and uh, more recently, Robin Dickey of the Aerospace Corporation, both all have really great uh, norms research. And also looking at the idea of public goods and the commons and management of both of those. Um, this is really where the idea for kind of a framework to consider how the different levels of governance and how they can be employed um, came about. Uh, sort of a, obviously a, a sort of simplified way to think of it, but um, a useful tool I, I found. So that being said, um, after that, I, I looked at sort of characterizing space. It, as it stands, is quite a polycentric governance system. I think that that I don't find um, to be debatable. It's there are national bodies, international bodies, and subnational bodies that all have overlapping interests and some level of, of governance or control oversight over um, different parts of space. But um, as it stands, you know, again, this is relatively simplistic, but helpful, helpful to visualize. Um, but sorry, moving on from that. Uh, I also took just a brief look at analogous domains. Um, there are so many that have different lesson, lessons to be learned. And obviously the, the lessons, the analogies break down a little, but um, looking at things like maritime, specifically commercial whaling and lobster fisheries, um, there are some serious, some useful historic, historical parallels um, about uh, different levels of management you know, lobster fisheries, there's the tension between self-governance and regulation coming from state bodies, uh, and seeing how those kind of work together to form a, a useful, flexible, and responsive governance system, um, commercial whaling. There are some historical parallels with how uh, governance systems had to walk back environmental degradation after technological change um, that I found pretty applicable. Uh, environmental management, as I had mentioned, the Ostrom workshop especially has done a lot of work looking at how um, different environmental management systems can be both responsive and um, also still not entirely self-governed. Um, and more recently, internet governance um, is more self-directed and informal, which uh, is interesting considering space definitely began formally, but now has, you know, the proliferation of space companies um, and the, the um, 
the impact that commercial companies have, um, there are some parallels that can be pulled there. It's also still evolving with the government kind of catching up to technological pace, uh, which can be similar to internet governance. Um, there's also, I looked, there's, you know, burgeoning artificial intelligence governance work. Um, a lot of it is sort of strictly advocating self-governance, uh, which I find interesting, uh, but there are some concerns, especially for, for space, and I think sustainability and environment with strictly self-governance. Um, so by large, uh, just a quick question. Why, sure, yeah. why are these, why are these domains analogous or how are they? Analogous? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, thank you for the question. So it varies. Definitely none are, are a one-to-one -one analogy. Um, everywhere is different. The physics is different in space, of course. Um, but with maritime, I think that's probably the one that has been uh, most often parallel to space. Um, you have the competing economic security, civil interests. There's, you know, um, especially with the commercial whaling around the Antarctic, it's got a lot of um, the sort of scientific civil interests that are similar to space, while also um, what changed a lot was the, the commercial capability in, in the area. Um, with lobster fisheries, what I found interesting was the, I don't want to say tension, but sort of the, the pull between the sort of commercial self-governed entities, the, the people with boats who were interested in, in just, um, you know, in their, their industry, but also in the larger maintenance of the environment. Um, the, oh no. Um, I, can you still hear me? I think our power has gone out here. No, I can still hear you. Yeah, you're fine. Okay, great. Then I think our Wi-Fi is still on, so we're good. <laughs> um, but the the larger the pull between the commercial action and the necessity of the environment and the maintenance of the environment to stay um, to continue the commercial activity, um, that balance seems sort of uh, reminiscent of space for sure. Um, with environmental management, I think it was more the, what I, I found as an interesting parallel anyway, was more the idea of um, the, um, sorry, the different, uh, again, the sustainability, the necessary, the necessity of sustain, sustaining the environment um, for, you know, there to be able to continue to use the water from rivers and uh, so on. Uh, internet governance, I think, on the face of it seems potentially, you know, a little bit more different. That's not quite so much a physical domain, but um, there are a lot more parallels, I think, in the fluidity of it, you know, um, and also that, I think, a lot more of the kind of idea of technology outpacing governance definitely happens in the internet. Um, and the same thing, artificial intelligence, it's a lot, a lot more, um, sorry, we're trying to figure out why the power has gone out. Um, artificial intelligence uh, is a lot newer. It's a lot more recent. Uh, so almost with space, almost, not almost, space definitely um, is, has a longer history, space governance. But I find the idea of um, the, the advocation for self-governance in artificial intelligence, I think you do see paralleled some with the advocation for um, strictly, you know, companies should govern themselves, the free market will take care of it. Um, I think both of those ideas have become prevalent in the conversations uh, for, for good or, or not, but- Thank you. Um, yeah, of course. No, thank you for the question. All right, let me, moving on. Um, so with, with all of these understandings, um, it was a good kind of breadth of research, but I was looking to pull them all together. And I, I love a framework, as I think most people in public policy do. Um, and I wanted a way to really understand, you know, with all of these different levels, how can we best use them, you know, you want to make sure that there's as um, 
some of the literature had said, you know, you want some overlap because some overlap is healthy. You do want um, you want some level of resilience there, but at the same time, you don't want um, too much overlap. You don't want too much repetition uh, when you could be building a more kind of flexible, responsive, uh, flexible, responsive governance system. So looking at this, I first, excuse me, I first went I first started to consider what I believed are what I believe are two of the most important kind of criteria to consider. Obviously, very simplified. There are a million different criteria, but these two I think um, really capture two of the most important things of any kind of space incident, which would be the barrier to entry. Um, it I don't know that it it matters matters too much if no one has access to the technology yet. Um, if there's a high barrier to entry, then there are, um, oh, okay, power, power's back. Uh, if there's a high barrier to entry, then there are, are fewer actors. It's less of a collective action problem. Um, and then the other side is the, the risk to operations. If there's a low risk to operations, um, then it's, it's a little bit easier to allow less oversight, to allow more self-governance um, because the consequences are, are less high. So that is kind of the how how this framework began um, was just thinking about the criteria, and um, of course it's just I think foundational still um, looking to sort of set the idea of how to start to to set different systems and different levels, and. Finally, I um, wanted to test this framework, and I, I looked at three different case studies in the paper, um, looking at space traffic management, looking at kind of the Artemis lunar landing sites and how eventually those will be um, used kind of more, uh, ideally more economic, for more economic purposes. Um, and those two were interesting because, and sort of what I expect to find was that with space traffic management, you know, it's kind of a, a mix of different levels, a, a mid and low level if you if you can. Um, and with the lunar landing sites, it would start higher. Obviously, there's a very high barrier to entry, but as that barrier to entry lowers, um, governance could be pushed lower to the um, the commercial entities that are interested, or um, to the different associations, or different kind of more local governance. Uh, the case study that I found the most interesting, however, was uh, the ASAP ban, which uh, is it was enacted at a high level and I believe should be enacted at a high level. Um, looking at the, the idea of anti-satellite tests and uh, the jeopard, the harm that they could cause to the environment, along with the, the barrier to entry of uh, direct ascent ASATs is also relatively high. Um, it just, it fell onto a, um, the highest level of governance of that, um, the framework. And um, it, it was interesting because I think most of the, the literature um, on polycentricity, it does lean a lot towards self advocating for self-governance or as much self-governance as possible. But I think the um, ASAT test ban really does show that that is good where necessary, where possible. Um, being able to have a more flexible, responsive governance governance system uh, does require having a lot of uh, kind of lower level governance. But um, the ASAT ban or things like ASAT tests and direct ascent ASATs um, are still definitely proof that high levels of governance, uh, international bodies and national bodies are very necessary. Um, so thank you for bearing with me through a, a, just a little bit of chaos, but um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them and thank you again. All right, thank you for that overview. And I think that's a, like a, a very good, um, uh, advertisement for folks to download and read the full report. You know, I'm looking of I'm looking at at some of these questions of uh, so if you want to do security related matters, 
that's and and we look at it from a polycentric lens we may be getting a different answer as to where to take security issues as opposed to other other norms that we need to be setting so is there some type of like a uh, rubric for where we should be guiding our our polycentric efforts depending on like the subject matter at hand the the, the challenge at hand the space sustainability challenge that i think if I had more time, I think I'd like to develop a criteria and look for more of a way to have a more in-depth rubric because it is, I think, generally speaking, uh, security issues because of the risk to operations, whether that be the risk to the environment or the risk to um, like country operations. Um, generally speaking, that would push it up higher. There's higher risk. Um, but there are things like there was um, a project actually here at UVA where um, a student for a capstone project was looking at different kinds of uh, space situational awareness and data sharing um, and how those things could be, um, how the commercial applications could kind of effectively be used, which was a, a really interesting question. And that's, I think, something that I've seen anyway, the DOD kind of grapples with regardless, um, the government kind of grapples with regardless is um, how to effectively man leverage uh, commercial capabilities and things that have, you know, some sensitive components. Um, there's definitely a, a problem of classification that would obviously push things up to a higher level as well. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have too many more criteria at the moment, but I'd, I'd love to think about them and do some more research about it for sure. Excellent. Thank you for that. So there's a number of questions. Uh, some of them are pretty detailed. I'm going to look at Sean's first. Are there any existing examples of formal or informal bodies which help either coordinate or adjudicate disputes? And, and feel free to answer that and, and go in any direction you want, though. Yeah, love that. Um, thank you for the question. I think that there are, at a higher level, some um, some of the the more formal bodies, you know, larger bodies like at the UN that I think are are expected to help adjudicate disputes. But what I think is missing and what might be useful to be able to push is um, lower levels. So I guess I don't know of any like commercial associations that might help disputes in between commercial actors. But um, if there are levels, one of the benefits to a polycentric system or an effectively managed polycentric system is um, that there's multiple levels for conflict resolution, um, which, you know, it's multiple bodies for, for dialogue. Um, I don't know of any off the top of my head, but that is, is definitely one of the, the benefits. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So I'm, uh, next question. Let's see. I'm going to read this, the second part of the question. Is it uh, or is maritime Internet environment a pretty good model to use as governance is developed? And the first part of our question was, do you think it'd be useful to consider less parallel domains for ideas on governance, governance since space can be so different? So, yeah, uh, uh, kind of complex, that one. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question. And I think um, I think that there's the usefulness. I think the utility of looking at analogous domains are that there are, you know, there are specific parallels to be drawn with lessons learned. Um, it's just sort of an easier, an easier tool to kind of understand how situations might arise. But I definitely think that there are, um, I mean, I think there are lessons to be learned from pretty much any environment. Um, but especially, I think, for kind of more um, kind of one-off, you know, like, I'm trying to think of a, a case and I can't really, but things that are very specific to space, there may be um, there may be less parallel domains that are they have one specific parallel that would be very useful. I think that I again, I really can't think of any off the top of my head, but I know that that would be a really good thing to study. Again, something I, I'd love to do. So <laughs> thank you. So all right, a related question was from Cynthia Harris. She writes on Comparing to environmental management, any lessons learned, whether good or bad, promising or otherwise, 
from environmental review processes involving multiple agencies, jurisdictional levels, uh, non-governmental stakeholders. So any lessons learned from, from other areas? Yeah, yeah. Um, again, this is gonna be things that I, I, I'm not great at thinking off the top of my head about. Um, but there are, I were there were a few, not so much the environmental review. Um, unfortunately, I can't think of any of those, but I'm sure there are some. Um, but I saw more in sort of environmental incenti incentives, um, things like if there were, one example was there were laws, there's federal leg legislation passed um, that was, you know, as federal legislation tends to be relatively broad about um, help it, having more incentives for building um, more environmentally, environmentally friendly homes. Those got filtered down into the state level, which were again, relatively broad, but then at the um, sort of the city municipal municipality level, um, there were directives about, you know, different kinds of credits to have, different kinds of, um, you know, things for solar panels, things for more, envi in, more, environment, more environmentally friendly appliances. Um, and so having, and then getting down, to the like um getting down to the i'm sorry i can't think of the word for um the, the provider like electricity provider they had very specific we have you know the hundred dollar rebate for this kind of solar panel or um things like that that were very specific incentives um i think that that was a was a useful parallel a useful lesson to be able to show that the utility of the system you know being able to have the broad goals at the highest level and then be able to filter them down so that they're useful specifically for the the small locality um i hope that answered the question <laughs> ah, all right so last question and and honestly this is a question we we get pretty continually anytime we talk about uh polycentric governance or international law so if you haven't faced it before may as well face it now Sure. Uh, why should anyone care about attempts at polycentric governance when there's most likely going to be bad actors who have his uh, and rogue states align with them have historically bowed out any effective international governance, which went against their interests when they could. In other words, if it's going to be the Wild West anyway, why should space actors invest resources into setting up governance as opposed to self-defense? So the common question we always get in international law, there's always going to be lawbreakers. Why have laws at all? Um, you may as well take it. And I'll also say that this is something that because we face it so often in talking about international space sustainability, it is ripe for actual further research as a space sustainability fellow. But let's see how you handle uh, that, that common question. There's always going to be bad actors. Sure. I, you know, I love the, the nihilism there for sure. But um, it is, I think, potentially more important to care about polycentric polycentricity and differing levels of governance when you're concerned about bad actors and when you're concerned that the the international level may fail because um, then looking at the different levels of the gov of governance um, you can see kind of where where if international bodies fail um, lower levels of governance might succeed um, I sort of think about and my mind always goes to commercial you know okay maybe internationally, um actors don't want to comply with with norm set or with with you know test bans but um if there's pressure enough pressure from an association or from important commercial actors then maybe it doesn't matter that they don't want to comply as much it doesn't matter as much that they don't want to comply with the the international norm um because you know companies on the ground are saying we're going to lose a lot of money if you screw this up for us um, so I think in that case, polycentric government and different levels may be, may be a good kind of fail safe, almost. All right, pretty good. I mean, I usually say we write down the law and we create laws even knowing that there's going to be criminals so that when criminals commit bad actions, we can point, we can all, we've all agreed this is what the law is. And it's better to have something written down than to have something which is, you know, a, a loose understanding of, of how people are supposed to behave. Um, all right. So with that, you're off the hook. Your sentence is, is finished. <laughs> you, you've done your work. 
Um, but I, you know, I think that uh, your your scholarship in this field is something which is going to be useful and uh, and and um, re referenced in the future. And we hope to see your scholarship in this area continue. Uh, and and I hope that you've created some some fresh ideas for the folks who are tuning in or going to be looking at your full um, your full report. Uh, with that, thank you so much. We're now going to move on to our next sustainability fellow. I will reshare the screen and make an introduction of Daniel Patton. So Daniel, if you can uh, turn your camera on, welcome. Daniel is an environmental specialist in Huntsville, originally from Virginia. Daniel worked for the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality before starting at his current position. Daniel has a bachelor's in environmental sciences from the University of Virginia and a master's in natural resources for, from Virginia Tech. So I'm going to give the mic or the uh, the remote control over to you, so you can advance your slides. And with that, Daniel, thank you for your full report, which we're going to put a link uh, in in the in the chat. Thank you for the executive summary, and the floor is yours. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm going to start just by thanking Secure World and uh, and Chris especially for facilitating this research. Um, the questions for the um, for the fellowship document is uh, here on the right side of the screen. Um, there's a lot of complex questions here, and we're not going to be able to get into a lot of depth in in all of these. But we're going to try to give sort of a high level overview of space as a commons. Um, so we'll talk about what a commons is, um, and we'll talk about why we're asking these questions. Um, we'll also um, describe and sort of qualify the, the space domain. Um, and then we'll look at our analogous domains, uh, some of the same stuff that Claire was talking about, Antarctica, um, the atmosphere, the oceans. Um, and then we'll do sort of an analysis of the existing space policy. Um, and we'll discuss some potential um, management strategies. Let's see. There we go. So what is a commons? Um, the term commons stems from the tragedy of the commons. This is often attributed to William Foster Lloyd, uh, sort of a metaphor for describing how um, resources um, can be depleted uh, by overuse. Um, basically a, a commons, a town commons was a shared green space in um, in a town used for the grazing of livestock, um, not owned by any individual, but shared by the participants. Um, and at a certain point, the number of livestock grazing on that land um, depletes the resource faster than the grass grows back. Um, and you have this, this tragedy where um, there are, are more livestock on the land than the land can support. Um, and the way this happens is there are individuals who have a, an incentive to add additional animals because they experience the benefit of that in, in terms of increased wool production or milk production um, or sale of those animals. Um, but the cost of the extra animal in terms of resource depletion um, is shared by all participants equally. So this describes a situation where the benefit is individual, but the cost is shared. Um, so that's what the tragedy of the commons was originally illustrating it. Um, Lloyd used it to sort of describe um, overpopulation and the risks of that. Um, the idea was sort of expanded by uh, Garrett Hardin um, to illustrate climate degradation. Um, and he, he applied it to sort of global commons, the idea that the oceans or the atmosphere um, is sort of um, a town commons shared by the whole world. Um, so when we talk about a commons, the economic criteria for a commons are uh, two things. It's, it's a rivalry and non-excludability. We'll get into that in a second. Um, but I do wanna make the distinction here between a commons and common pool of resource. Um, a commons is the domain, the space, um, and the common pool resource is the actual resource within it. So in our classic commons example, the commons is the commons, of course, um, and the grass or um, whatever is growing there is the resource. Uh, that's the thing that's depleted um, or excluded. Um, 
that's so that distinction is important when we talk about this that line is sort of blurred when we talk about space uh because in a lot of situations in space the domain is the resource um you know there's nothing in earth orbit that's being consumed uh by satellites it's the position the position is the resource um so that line is sort of blurred but that's an important distinction that we want to um make sure we're aware of um so the importance of commons determination um Proper management of, of any domain, but especially outer space, is critical for the continued use of that domain. And there are risks in the space domain. There's risks of Kessler syndrome. Um, this is the um, situation where um, you know, satellites collide and create debris that collides with more satellites that creates more debris. And you get this sort of cascading um, collision effect such that there's so much debris in orbit, it becomes very difficult to launch anything. Um, outside of Earth's atmosphere. That's Kessler syndrome. That's one risk. Um, another risk is resource monopolies. Um, you know, something that a lot of space actors are talking about now is um, in situ resource utilization, um, whether it's on the moon or Mars or, or even asteroids. Um, the early actors, the early, um, early arrivers um, to the moon or to Mars, um, there are limited resources there and they could monopolize those resources if they're the first ones there. Um, and they're not abundant resources. So that's another risk. Um, so there's there's risks for the space domain and proper management protects us from those risks. Um, a consistent space utilization policy also um, protects from spoilage and exploitation of resources um, and deciding if space is a commons um, or deciding it's not a commons uh, determines how uh, stakeholders operate within the domain. Um, one of the challenges with space is that states and leaders have expressed contradicting views on whether space is a commons or not. Um, so this consensus is important for how we operate within the domain, but we don't really have consensus on whether space is a commons. Um, if you work or research in the um, space economics or space law uh, or space policy world, you probably have an opinion on whether space is a commons. Um, and I doubt that everybody on this call has the exact same opinion. There's a lot of contradicting views. Um, and uh, I wanted to explore why, why we have those contradicting views. Um, so as I mentioned before, the criteria for commons determination is uh, rivalry and excludability. So when we say something is rivalrous, we mean that a resource is finite, um, that its, its use or occupation by one person reduces its availability. Um, for another person um, and excludable, um, we say um, commons are, are non-excludable. If something's excludable, it means that um, you can control access or use of that resource. Um, so, you know, like a fish stock, that's something that's rivalrous because um, if I take more fish, there's less available for the people. Um, and it's not really excludable because you can't just like put a wall or a net around all the fish in the sea, right? Um, Something like uh, radio stations would be like a, a non-rivalrous, non-excludable. Um, you know, if I listen to the radio, my neighbor doesn't have less availability to that radio station, um, and it's not really excludable, and that you can't, you know, uh, limit it. I, I mean, there's there's ways to limit radio stations, I guess, if you can uh, encode or encrypt a, a radio frequency. But um, you know, just a regular radio station, we consider that um, non-excludable. So the traditional understanding of um, this um, commons criteria is sort of these are binary attributes, right? There's excludable and there's non excludable. There's rivalrous and there's non rivalrous. Um, and something has to fit in one of those um, four areas. It has to fit in one of those four categories. Um, that's the, the traditional understanding. Um, modern researchers sort of understand now that. Um, these are not necessarily binary attributes. There's a continua. There's things that are, you know, two things that are both rivalrous. One is probably more rivalrous than the other. Um, and the same thing goes for excludability. Um, so one of the first steps in understanding, um, you know, a commons determination um, is to understand rivalry and excludability, not as binary attributes, but as this continua. And using that, we can sort of chart um, or graph um, the, the status of various domains. So we've sort of done that here, uh, radio stations and roads, they're both sort of public goods, but radio stations are um, probably less excludable than a roadway is. Um, or, you know, you say that, uh, you know, fish stocks or um, the oceans are 
um, you know, non-excludable in Antarctica is also maybe non-excludable, but it's it's definitely more excludable because it's territory and we do that all the time. Um, you see where I'm going with this. Uh, these things don't fit in these neat categories. We, we have sort of a range here, um, which explains why there's so much confusion and so much disagreement about whether something is a commons or not, especially when it comes to space. Um, the fact that there's a range here, different people draw that line for what's low and high excludability or what's low or high rivalry. They draw that line at different places, uh, which means that um, their categories for where things fall are, are probably different. Um, so that sort of explains why there's um, a little bit of confusion about this. Um, and you know, you see here the rivalry excludability continua for various terrestrial domains. Um, but I want to do the same thing for space domains. Um, one of the things I realized when doing this research is that we talk about space as this uniform domain. Space is one thing. It's really um, not one thing. It's a collection of things. Um, and the various parts of space are used very differently. Um, something like Earth orbit is very different from celestial bodies in terms of um, how it's used um, and its availability, its access, um, and especially in terms of those criteria we were talking about for the commons. Um, you know, the atmosphere or the um, Earth orbit rather is um, far less excludable than something like a particular part of the moon. Um, so seeing these differences by, by dividing space into these subcategories, um, we see that they, they differ in terms of their rivalry and excludability, um, not just from terrestrial domains, but from each other as well. Um, and as such, um, we need to consider them separately, consider whether they are commons, um, each individually, not, not as one uniform domain, but as a subdomain. So that's what I did here. I, I put the um, space domains in the same rivalry excludability continua. And in doing this, we can see pretty clearly that um, you know, some domains are very seem to fit in the common pool resource or the commons section um, pretty well, like low Earth orbit, geostationary orbit. Other things like the moon might be considered private goods if you're looking at just rivalry and excludability. Obviously, they're not they're not owned, and we've agreed that um, you can't make um, territorial claims on the moon, but um, it's technically more excludable than you know, low Earth orbit. So we, we put them in different places here. Um, and now we see why it's so difficult to, um, to regulate and talk about space as a commons. Um, now it's important to note that just because something is not definitionally a commons, economically speaking, it doesn't mean it can't be regulated as a commons. Um, we look at Antarctica. Um, Antarctica is excludable to some extent, right? You could defend that territory. It could be claimed and defended. Um, and you know, we'll get into the Antarctic Treaty in a moment. But um, just because something does not fit neatly in that common pool resource category doesn't mean it can't be um, managed as a commons. Um, and that is um, that seems to be what has been expressed by by various stakeholders: <clears throat> the desire to um, manage resources based domains as commons, uh, whether or not they fall in that category. Um, so I want to talk about analogous domains. This is a helpful framework for how we talk about space domains and, and help shaping policy. Um, one, Antarctica, we, we just talked about that. Um, notably, the Antarctic Treaty doesn't require nations to um, renounce their previously asserted rights or claims, although it does require them to act as, those, as though those claims don't exist. It requires certain technology and information sharing. Um, and but it does require that states can't make additional claims or expand claims. Antarctica is sort of this um, strange thing that we call a commons and manage as a commons, um, but like I said, doesn't sort of fit neatly in that category um, like some other domains do. Um, the oceans, it's, it's another um, classic commons we talk about. This is probably the longest history of commons management is the ocean. Um, and there's a long list of agreements, including the law of the sea that uh, was mentioned previously, I think, in one of the questions. Um, but you know, that's not exhaustive at all. Of course, there's there's things like um, fisheries agreements, fish stocks agreement, um, the International Convention on the Regulation of Whaling, things like this. There's a whole list of um, oceans management agreements um, on the international level, um, and of 
of course, on the um, national and local level as well. Um, one of the interesting things about the ocean domain is that um, there are different resource use categories. There's biological resources like fish and um, whales and seaweed. There's territorial resources. There's you know coastal coastal waters, and then of course there's like the energy and mining resources. Um, you know oil, uh, deep seabed minerals um, and metals, those types of things. Um, and interestingly, those are um, managed separately. They're all not, they're not all managed under one um, agreement. They're managed with separate agreements. You know, we have fisheries agreements that, uh, and we have uh, the law of the sea, we have um, the um, international seabed, um, uh, um, the international seabed regime that we'll talk about in a moment, um, which is uh, something important to keep in mind when we talk about space domains. Um, the uh, ability or the opportunity to um, manage different categories of resource use separately. Um, I wanted to mention especially um, the International Seabed Authority, which was formed parallel to the Convention on the Law, on the Law of the Sea. Um, the ISA um, works with private and state-sponsored mining organizations to um, distribute um, both technology resources and mining sites to assure um, equitable access to deep seabed mineral resources. Um, this is a really interesting way to um, approach this domain. And, um, you know, there's uh, possibilities of applying a similar strategy, strategy to um, in situ resource utilization on, on, um, on uh, celestial bodies like the moon or, or Mars. The atmosphere is the third um, third category. I, I talked about it in the paper. Um, obviously, atmospheric regulation is primarily focused on pollution, um, but similar to um, the ocean domain, there's not just a single agreement. There are um, you know, multiple agreements targeted at specific pollutants. Um, there's a couple listed here, the, the Kyoto Protocol, Paris Agreement, Montreal Protocol. Um, you know, Montreal Protocol, uh, specifically target CFCs, um, and it, it's been broadly successful. The, the ozone layer, um, you know, researchers estimate it could return to pre-1980 levels by 2050. Um, I don't think it's a, a stretch to imagine that that level of success might not have been achieved if this was lumped in with other, other pollutants like greenhouse gases. Um, there's an advantage to um, managing um, sections of a domain um, individually, um, whether it's resources, pollutants, um, or subsections of those domains. So I want to talk about some of the um, existing um, existing space policy. Um, of course, the main one is the Outer Space Treaty. Um, here's a couple um, sections of the, the treaty um, mentioned here, and, and these are just a couple that I pulled out that seem to reinforce this um, common status. Um, you know, the um, exploration for the um, you know, shall be for the um, province of all mankind, right? The outer space will be free for exploration by use of all states, um, not subject to national appropriation, similar to Antarctica, like we talked about, um, astronauts, envoys of mankind. These types of words, they seem to reinforce this perspective of, of space as a commons, although it doesn't ever really come out and say um, space is a commons in, in those exact words. Um, there's a whole collection of, of other agreements. Um, the Rescue Agreement, Liability Convention, and Registration Convention are, are probably the three main ones. Um, rescue Agreement protects uh, spaceflight crews by committing to rescue and warning of hazards. Um, liability Conventions, nations are liable for damages caused by their spacecrafts. Um, registration Convention is designed to track positions and purposes of space objects. Um, Important to note is, is that while we have these agreements, they're not necessarily universally uh, successful. The Cosmos 954 accident in 1977 saw the failure of a four ton Soviet reconnaissance satellite. Um, the nuclear reactor core um, you know, was destroyed in this failure and um, scattered nuclear debris across Northern Canada. Um, the Canadian government spent, I think over $6 million cleaning up this debris. Um, and under the liability convention, then the Soviet Union would have been responsible for reimbursing um, that cost. Um, I think less of that, um, less than half of that amount was ever reimbursed. So while we have these agreements, um, 
they're not universally successful in managing the domain, um, even when they are targeted at something like liability specifically. Um, two other uh, agreements or declarations that I wanted to mention, the Moon Agreement, um, the Moon Agreement is one that's um, been sort of less successful than some of these other agreements with only 11 signatories. Um, the Moon Agreement um, sort of applies um, a structure for operating on the moon, um, but has had less adoption. Um, one reason for that might be, um, you know, the last sentence of this quote here, um, all space vehicles, equipment, facilities, stations, and installations on the moon shall be open to other states' parties. Um, you know, many, many saw that as sort of a step too far, especially considering um, how valuable and closely held some of the space technology is um, and allowing um, access to other states' parties um, you know, was seen by some as sort of an overreach. Um, Bogota Declaration, um, you know, this is, I, I think seven equatorial countries um, got together and, and, you know, declared that um, the segments of geostationary orbit um, above the territory um, were, were part of that, that country's national sovereignty. Of, of course, this was, um, you know, rejected by most non-equatorial countries. Um, you know, if if it wasn't, then um, they wouldn't really be able to operate in that domain. Um, and um, that also sort of reinforces that that Commons uh, perspective. You know, if we saw geostationary orbit as a um, as a private good, then um, there would be national sovereignty. You could claim national sovereignty, but um, it seems that um, actors. Do not want to agree to that. Um, so we've talked about some of the um, existing space management mechanisms, some of these um, treaties and policies. Um, we can now analyze them. Um, Eleanor Ostrom, who uh, Claire mentioned in, in her presentation, um, in her book, Governing the Commons, she uh, identifies eight design principles for effective commons management. She um, you know, looked at uh, commons all around the world and, and pulled out these eight design principles for the things that are required for um, successful management of a domain. Um, you know, stuff like clearly defined boundaries, um, monitoring of the situation, graduated sanctions, um, conflict res resolution mechanisms, um, nested enterprises, that sort of gets at that polycentricity thing that Claire was talking about there. Um, so using uh, Ostrom's institutional analysis, we can apply this to the space domains and evaluate um, these subdomains of space. We can evaluate, um, you know, Earth orbit, celestial bodies, and interplanetary space. We can evaluate them um, based on this institutional analysis to see how they perform or how they're likely to perform um, in a more crowded space economy. So that's what I've done here, and this is explained in, in more depth in the, in the actual paper, but um, some of the takeaways from this are, are that Earth orbit is a pretty fragile uh, performance in terms of um, it, this institutional analysis. Celestial bodies and interplanetary space are, are even worse. They're likely to fail um, based on these criteria that Ostrom has presented. Um, the, the main gaps are uh, sanctions, conflict resolution mechanisms, and nested units. Um, there's the main gaps, and, and celestial bodies are, are probably at the highest risk here of um, resource failure. Um, that's because, um, you know, while interplanetary space and celestial bodies are, are both likely to fail, the uh, demand uh, and um, potential use of celestial bodies and the limited access to them um, means they're, uh, they're much more likely to fail. They're, they're going to experience more, more traffic, more activity um, than something like interplanetary space, which is um, far vaster and, um, you know, less competitive uh, in that sense. So potential management strategies. Um, first thing, uh, you know, a, a potential strategy would be to address the common pool resources separately, as is done with the oceans and the atmosphere. Um, you know, there are separate policies for space domains, the Liability Convention, Registration Convention, but they uh, work on the space domain as a whole. They don't work on specific sections, whether it's celestial bodies or Earth orbit um, or interplanetary space. Um, the next is to institute graduated sanctions, conflict resolution mechanisms, and nested units. If, if the goal is um, for a more robust performance, um, then 
these have been identified as, as the gaps in that performance and opportunities for, um, for uh, additional uh, policy management. Um, the third is examine existing terrestrial policy uh, and use that to shape similar outer space management, uh, outer space resource management. Um, you know, we talked about this uh, deep sea bed mineral um, management um, and how that might be applied to uh, resource utilization in outer space. Um, using these terrestrial policies that are um, working at least to some extent um, on Earth, uh, you know, they can be uh, used to shape um, used to shape space policy. Um, now, that's not to say that we can copy these things over. Obviously, space is a unique domain. There are unique um, challenges in terms of access, in terms of resource types, uh, in, in terms of um, the use of space for, um, for economic and research purposes. Um, space is not, not exactly like the moon, or space is rather is not exactly like the oceans or the atmosphere. Um, it's unique, and, and therefore, um, any sort of terrestrial policy has to be shaped um, and changed uh, to fit the space domain. Um, and the last thing is uh, we can explore novel governance concepts. Um, you know, there's a lot of great research here. I, I mentioned some of it in the paper. I'm not going to get into a lot of it here. Um, but uh, novel governance is, is there's an opportunity there to look at um, you know new um, new governance concepts uh, as a way to um, implement those into space management. So in conclusion, um, we see that space, it's not uniform, right? We have these subdomains that are not all identical. Um, and while some are definitionally a commons by economic criteria, others are not. Um, and if they are not, um, you know, they still may be managed as a commons um, if stakeholders express a desire and agree to treat them as a commons. They can be managed as a commons whether they meet those exact criteria or not. Um, Current management strategies, they don't appear to be robust enough to withstand the expected changes in the use of outer space um, in the space economy. Um, that's what that institutional analysis from Ostrom shows us. Um, but terrestrial domains, uh, they can be a helpful guidebook for shaping commons management, although not without, um, without changes um, and, um, and evolution of those strategies um, to make them fit into the um, unique um, attributes of, of the space domain. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to Chris and we'll um, open it to some questions, I think. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna first go back to one of your slides, uh, this one about space domain continua, because I wanna, I, I, I wanna have a concrete answer on this. You know, uh, let's say you hear it asserted that space is a commons or that space is not a commons. Um, what is your response if you uh, if you're at a symposia or some type of diplomatic conference and someone says, well, we all agree that space is not a commons, um, you know, and you want to give a nuanced, informed, factual response to that. What, what is your response to be to be concrete and clear here? Yeah, well, um, if we say space is not a commons, I think we can, um, uh, while not maybe dismiss that view, um, we, can, um, we can see that evidence clearly says that um, certain parts of space are definitionally commons. They are non-excludable and they are rivalrous. They meet those categories. So yes, space is a commons, um, you know, whether, whether you think it is or not, um, but other parts of space are not. To say all of space is a commons, that might be a step too far. We, that might be saying too much. Um, it can be true, it, we can manage all of space as a commons if we agree on that, um, but that agreement doesn't appear to be present right now. Um, and if it, if it does become present, then there are additional policies um, that need to be changed and shaped in order to effectively manage them as such. What areas of space are not commons? Well, you might say, you, you can make the argument that the moon is not a commons, right? If you're looking at just this rivalry excludability continua or these, these categories, the moon, you know, technically excludable, right? You could, you could put something, some sort of, um, you know, you could take a section of the moon and say, this is mine. You could put a fence around it and defend it as sovereign territory um, feasibly, although we've agreed not to do that, right? You could 
you know, economically speaking, it could be uh, claimed as sovereign territory. Um, it, it's not impossible to do that. So in that sense, you know, the moon or Mars or, or an asteroid, um, you could say that it doesn't meet those criteria exactly. Um, so that's sort of sort of where I, where I go with that. Something like interplanetary space, some people might say that's not a commons because it's not really a rivalrous. You know, if, if I'm um, in one section of interplanetary space, there's plenty of other inter interplanetary space for someone else to occupy. Um, you know, people might make that argument. Um, but uh, there are certain parts that you really can't say they, it's not, um, it's not rivalrous or it's excludable, you know, low earth orbit, um, geostationary orbit, those really, that really fits in that category pretty well. Um, and there's others, you know, there, there can be some disagreement there. Um, so that's how I'd answer that. All right, great. I'm going to stop sharing, but I, I have a couple more questions on that. First is, you know, the analysis that you've done, um, is this a legal analysis? Is this an economics or social sciences analysis? Is this a political analysis? Like, um, how, how, what type of, how would you characterize this research and discussions about space as a commons? Yeah, um, I think that's a great point. And, and I get into this a little more in the actual paper, but um, when we talk about what's a commons, we have to say, well, what kind of commons are we talking about? Economic commons is what I mostly addressed in this presentation, but when we talk about a legal commons, um, you know, that's sort of a different question. Um, and, or a political commons, you know, um, the criteria for those are, are slightly different. We focus mostly on economic commons in this paper because it's the most, it's probably the easiest to define. Um, but um, that, that's another reason why there's a lot of confusion over this question is because uh, we're using different um, operational definitions of commons um, when we talk about it. Uh, all right, and I see a whole bunch of really interesting questions, but first I wanna ask, let's see here. Um, so if the economic analysis says that space is a commons, then why do people's opinions on this matter? If it, it like is the, uh, why are you, um, in other words, are we having a debate about the facts or a, or a philosophical debate about how to govern that, these domains? Um, I expect it's both. Um, I, I imagine there are some who would say that no space is a commons because there are motivations to not manage it as such. There, you know, the, the earliest people, earliest um, groups to access a domain, um, whether it fits in that commons category or not, have an advantage in terms of um, the use of that resource. So there, there are certainly motivations to um, describe space as, as not a commons. Um, so to one extent, there is some, um, some conversation about the facts here, um, but there's also a lot about policy. You know, once we establish these facts, there's still this whole other discussion about um, how we manage it um, and uh, what we want policy to look like. All right, thank you. I mean, and, and that idea about whether we're having an economics discussion or a social science discussion or a legal discussion, that's where I, you know, I have a differing view um, about what the law says and what the law doesn't say and whether it comes to a conclusion or whether it's silent. Uh, and I should make it clear, uh, I'm only speaking on behalf of my personal capacity, not an organization. You are not speaking on, uh, on behalf of any organization. This is only your, your scholarship and your finding, uh, you know, meant to be impartial. Um, so let's see, I, I'm trying to look at those questions that we have and see, is there any order that they could be structured? But I was immediately, uh, you know, interested in this question from Akhil uh, regarding nested units. Would that be the first one? Actually, no, I think I wanna go to uh, Sean's question. A lot of good questions today, Sean. What are your thoughts, if any, on space being declared a commons for a limited time, such as 50 years. I suspect part of the hesitance with the idea of a commons is how much things could change long-term. Any responses? Um, yeah, I mean, that's certainly a policy and it's probably better than, than nothing in terms of um, coming to an agreement. Um, you know, one of the things we see in um, commons management in terrestrial domains is that they're not static. Um, there are, um, always changes to, um, to these policies. You know, you look at the atmosphere of the ocean, the ocean has this long history of management um, and some of it's very recent, some of it's, it's not. Um, and, uh, you know, you can do things temporarily, but I expect either way, the way we manage space is going to change. Um, that would sort of be my, my prediction. Um, does that answer that question? 
I believe so. All right. Um, if not, Sean, as, uh, submit another question or send us send us something offline. Uh, there's two questions about nested units. The first one is from uh, Professor Rao. Uh, regarding nested units, do you have a sense from the literature of what an appropriate or useful nesting would be for orbital space? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I think the first thing, they're sort of nested units in, in how we talk about these subdomains, right? Um, you know, we have space as as one domain, and then we can manage these uh, Earth orbit and um, you know um, interplanetary space and um, celestial bodies as as um, you know we can have that sort of nested units. But there's also um, in terms of use, you know, you can talk about um, uh, you can have nested units for um, the application of, of space, you know, research or economic or um, defense, you, you know, there's um, there's lots of different ways to do it. I, I didn't focus a lot on the um, literature for how things are nested. Um, that's a whole a whole other discussion, um, and there's there's a lot to dig into there. I didn't get into a lot of that, um, but there's certainly um, lots of different ways to do it. Okay. Further question on, on nested units. It was from Marie Frank. How exactly did you come to the conclusion that the design principle of nested enterprises is not met? in the earth orbits not sure i understand that question so you can't see how exactly did you come to the conclusion that the design principle of nested enterprises is not met um so i, I was looking at um both what's in in the actual um what's in the language of space agreements um but also in um, how they have been, how effective those have been. Um, so, you know, I sort of looked at both of those. Um, you know, this was sort of, the, the way I scored this, it, it was, you know, sort of just me looking at this. Um, you know, obviously we, um, you know, worked with some of the um, folks at Secure World as well, but, um, you know, this is sort of my analysis. I would, I would welcome um, any, any evidence to um, oppose or correct some of my uh, judgments there on, on that. Um, you know, I'm just looking at what the policy says and, and how it seems to operate. Um, but it's possible that, um, you know, I categorize something as, as weak and it, it's uh, stronger than I'm, than, I'm, um, than I'm saying it is. Um, so I certainly wouldn't say that my uh, determination on any of those design principles is definitive. Okay, uh, in the Q&A, have a look at the last question, also by Marie Frank, kind of a longer detailed question that you might have to think about for a little bit. What is the difference between a commons and a CPR, according to Ostrom? And yeah, you go ahead and read it. Okay, yeah, what's the difference between a commons and a common pool resource, according to Ostrom? In your paper, you write global commons are commons containing CPRs. Um, Ostrom defines CPR as a resource system. Um, emphasis is on system. Um, this system provides uh, resource units. How would you apply this to low Earth orbit? Um, okay, this is a, a great question, and I, I like where this is going. Um, a lot of my um, discussion between or distinction between CPRs, um, common pool resources, and commons um, is a simplification of this process. There's, there's a lot of, um, like Ostrom defines it as a system. Um, uh, as a resource system, others might define a common pool resource as um, uh, just the resource within the commons. I, I'm trying to sort of simplify it here. I, I'm not just mapping um, Ostrom's definition. Um, that being said, um, there can be some confusion, which is why I made that distinction in the paper. Um, but um, you know, if we had this, if we we're using Ostrom's uh, definition of a CPR, um, then you know we would need to look at low Earth orbit slightly differently. I think. All right, and uh, up at the top, this question by Matt, which stakeholders are, are you referring to that are in favor of a global commons approach? We might need to ask Claire uh, on that one yeah, also. Yeah, Claire, you wanna come back and answer this question <laughs> for me? Um, well, so I would say there, there are definitely certain, um, like when we look at um, the Outer Space Treaty or, or the, um, the moon agreement or you know there seems to be language in existing policy that supports the commons designation although as i said before it doesn't come out and say it exactly um there are statements from um you know various um 
various agencies um, that seem to support this. Um, there is not a lot of um, like very clear language that says this is a comment or this is not. Um, you know, there's there's a few things. Um, I think uh, uh, there was a a statement um, or a, a declaration from um, from President Trump a, a couple years ago that said space is not a commons. Use that language exactly. Um, yep. that seemed to contradict some language from um, the Obama administration. Um, and uh, there, I think there are some, um, you know, various other other states have made um, comments that seem to support or seem not to support. So it's not exactly clear. Um, I hope that answers that question. All right, I'm going to take this last question from Caroline Caroline Wittenberg. Um, if you take a look at that, um, how can a legal framework, either internationally or nationally, work in potential management strategies? That she then asks, how can a legal framework be incorporated in either space as a commons or not? So, any responses to that? Um, I don't know. Uh, this the legal framework section. Um, this probably falls beyond the scope of the research here. Um, and Chris, this probably falls more squarely in your territory in terms of um, your expertise. Um, certainly, um, you know, we talk about um, polycentricity for this. There's, there's international and national, those things work in partnership, um, not necessarily we have to address it one or the other. Um, how can a legal framework be incorporated in either space as a commons or not? Um, you, I guess that that comes down to how you shape policy. Um, there's a lot of a um, lot of scholarship on that. I think um, something I just barely dipped my toes into in this research is some of the institutional grammar and and how we shape policy in that way. Um, I think that can be a helpful tool as well. Okay. All right. I said last question, but then I saw this one from Alfonso, which is also very good. So we I have to ask you: Would self regulation be compatible? With the management of other celestial bodies as a commons, so self-regulation. Um, I guess that depends on who you ask. Um, some some people would say um, self-management is the way to go, um, and uh, it, it seems that that's less successful um, uh, based on um, history and um, you know self-management generally. Um, doesn't work when there are um, competing motivations. You know that's the whole reason why the um, why the tragedy of the commons exists because the benefit is experienced by the individual, but the cost is shared by all of the users. Um, Self regulation uh, users are incentivized to act in their own interest. Um, you know that's the basis for the tragedy of the commons. Um, so self regulation, um, you know, there's there's times it has worked and. Um, but for um, you know something as broad as space, um, I think um, you know generally that that's seen as less successful. Um, I don't know, Chris, do you have anything to add there? Well, I mean, I, it made me think of this slide that you had um, about institutional performance, and so you're looking at these, you know, on the right hand side, institutional performance either fragile or likely to fail. Um, although, is, is it, it's kind of tied to what you were just talking about. Although, you know, as you look across those 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 rows, um, conflict resolution mechanisms, graduated sanctions, you know, you have a very dim dim view of, you know, whether um, there'll be sustainability and rule of law and, um, mm -hmm. you know, governance of, of some of these common places like celestial bodies. So it kind of ties into that. Is that tied to why you think um, self-regulation may, you know, bodes ill? Um, yeah, I mean, that's part of it. I think we can also just look at um, the existing um, domain management um, commons domains on Earth as sort of, you know, we can look at history and, and how self-regulation has worked um, in those. Um, you know, I can't see the future and, um, you know, you say it's a bit of a dim view here. I think that's, that's probably true. I'm, I'm probably taking, um, you know, this is not, not beyond criticism, um, but um, I think history can um, can indicate um, the likelihood of of um, the success of self-regulation. 
All right. Thank you so much, Daniel. We really put you through the ringer with these questions. It was a lightning round of very challenging stuff. I'm thankful for all the attendees who put in those questions. We didn't get to all of them. But listen, this is just, you know, the beginning of a conversation or the continuing of a conversation that's been going on for decades. Uh, we hope that, you know, if, if since you called in and, and all those folks who are attendees, you care about these concepts, you care about these issues. Uh, we encourage you and your institutions and your home organizations to continue on with these discussions. We hope that our report and our, uh, the executive summary and the scholarship from Daniel and Claire have contributed to the discourse and brought to the fore some things which are often, too all too often, you know, alluded to or there's assumptions about or conclusory opinions without much deeper thought. So we wanted to contribute to some of that deeper thought and we hope that, and, and we're certain that these conversations are going to continue in the future. You have uh, our reports to download. You have the slides to find. Uh, this video recording is going to be uh, placed on likely YouTube and a couple, uh, maybe YouTube and and, and also our website. Um, so that's going to be uh, it for this year's uh, fellowship. I want to mention two things first. A uh, brief plug for our Summit for Space Sustainability this summer in New York, June 13 and 14. Um, you can learn more at swfsummit.org, uh, where we're going to be having um, related discussions. And I hope that uh, the work that we've done in the Sustainability Fellows will contribute and inform some of the discussions that we're going to have there. And um, this research that we're doing at Secure World on these persistent underlying questions in space sustainability is going to continue. This was the first cohort of sustainability fellows, Daniel and Claire, with the questions that we posed to them. In 2023, we are going to continue to work on these underlying questions. Likely, it is going to focus on what is happening at the UN with the um, discussions on responsible behavior in space and therefore irresponsible behavior, the anti-satellite, um, uh, anti-ASAT uh, work and bans and prohibitions and unilateral declarations being made, looking at how to foster that and how, if we can do research which informs those debates and those discussions and deliberations, if there are persistent assumptions that happen in those debates about, you know, unilateral declarations, the worth of unilateral declarations, et cetera, et cetera. What can we as civil society, as one actor in civil society, contribute to those discussions and make them worthwhile? So stay tuned for what we're going to do, continue to do here at Secure World. Um, find those reports. I hope our scholarship has been useful. Um, and the footnotes to it also will lead you in other directions. And we look forward to further scholarship um, from Daniel and Claire and from many of the attendees that have joined us. So with that, uh, I'm going to uh, thank everyone for attending and end this meeting. Thank you so much, everyone, and I'll see you in the future.